Right, so hello everyone. And my talk is Demystify Python Types for PAP729. Uh, before I start my talk, I want to just have a poll here. So how many of you have heard about PAP729? Please raise your hand. Right, actually not a, that many. Uh, that's probably good because that's the reason you sit here. Uh, PAP stands for Python Enhancement Proposals, and PAP729 is about a typing governance process. So today, let's take a look at this PAP first because we demystify Python types for it, right? Um, PAP729, um, if you check the, this thing, uh, originally there's a thread, a discussion, a very short one. People are basically there say, uh, thanks for consolidating all the things we already discussed somewhere offline, so this Basically, it's the PAP. And this PAP, what it does is simply just a new way to govern Python type system, as, as the name stands for. Um, uh, a, a part I would like you to, to take a look into is the, this PAP was endorsed. It, it claims it was endorsed by maintainers of all major type checkers. So that's important thing, and let's look into it. So the initial member here, you may see some face you'll be familiar with. Uh, of course, Grido here, and other type related or C Python developers here. Um, so um, the motivation of this PAP, uh, you can see uh, four points mentioned in this PAP. First one is like they say, uh, PAPs are the only specification, and I mean, what does that mean? Means that, um, for example. Um, if you developed uh, a PAP, usually you probably don't only think about like uh, how this PAP impacts the Python, but in, in for, for Python types case, uh, it's also involved the uh, external tools, and in here we, we mean type checkers. So because there are many type checkers, so that's one motivation, they, they want a different way to govern the type. And second thing is like uh, uh, PAP is hard to evolve, so uh, which means like, um, Certain spe specific imp implementation, in fact, the third point the same is like uh, the PAPs try not to specify the detail of the implementation. However, um, in this particular Python types case, it could be something like, um, I would say, uh, this should be specified, and that could be the thing that uh, this PAP can um, likely, the wonderful motivation for that. And finally, the fourth point is not something I mentioned. It's just uh, they say that Steering Console uh, is not well placed to solve for both problems. And that, that's basically what they say. And um, of course, I cannot, on behalf of a Steering Console or people, talk about this point, but I will just say that like, it may make sense because uh, of today's content, I will say once you dive deep into it, you will see like uh, how deep the type is and may not be a good place for them to discuss that detail. And if you check some PAP, for example, PAP 695, uh, well, it's not important about this PAP's content. This, this PAP just has a talk uh, in Python US this year. Uh, the thing is, like, once you check this PAP, you see it, there's a yellow box there. And that yellow box just tell you, like, uh, okay, you should go to another type specification process instead of here. And this is a kind of historical do document. So let's basically answers like, okay, it, this is already something uh, ongoing. All right, so uh, we know this PAP729 thing, and it, to me, just like, okay, I read the motivation, it looks just, uh, makes sense, but what does that mean? And what, what is type, what type do they mean, and why do we need this new process? That's something, um, I want to dive deep a bit into it. So that's my motivation to, of this talk. Um, let me just introduce myself again. Uh, I skipped that in the beginning. Um, this is my first time uh, in EuroPython in person. So I gave a talk during COVID remotely before. Um, I, am, I am part of the PyCon Taiwan community. We have a conference uh, this year in September 21st and 2nd. And it held not in the main city. Usually you hear about Taiwan is Taipei, but it's in Kaohsiung this time. It's a port city, so if you want to visit somewhere in Taiwan, uh, now the, the majority of people visit, then this will be a good chance for you to be there. And we also have a podcast called PyCast. Uh, it's basically target audience can speak Mandarin, so not sure how many of you here can speak that, but if you are, then this definitely will be something uh, I will recommend to check out. 
Okay, so table of contents today, um, I will talk about this like a counter onion thing, but I will talk about the core thing first. So we talk about type theory and gauge typing theory and type checkers and new specifications. We we'll go through all, all, all the thing to demystify pattern types. Uh, so why we need to talk about type theory? That's because we want to answer what is type in Python or maybe whatever programming languages. Uh, this code, I think, whatever level, probably you learn Python, probably your day one, you already can know this code here. It's like you, you, you just assign some variable, um, a, a true value and a false value to another variable, and you can print that now, you can compare that, and you can do some operation on them. Uh, the thing is, like, uh, we know like uh, A is a true variable, and A is a Boolean type. This is probably something we, we, may, we may already know in the, the day one's book, but what does a Boolean type actually mean for a programming language? That's something uh, we should know today. So type theory uh, is a representation of a specific type system. Um, so if you study other theories like uh, stat theory, category theory, logic and proof theory, and so on, uh, you'll know like there's a thing called HOT, H-O-T-T. Uh, uh, this theory bridges all those things together. So it's not mean, it doesn't mean like a set theory is equivalent to category theory. To be honest, I also don't really know about all those theories, but I'll just say like today, the content will be, although we talk about type theory, I'll use set a lot here, because that's a probably easiest thing to understand type. <clears throat> okay, so um, look at this expression. Um, X is an element of uh, A. This is X expression. What does this mean? Um, in type theory, when you say X is an element of A, um, by permuting love, one of the uh, type theories, um, kind of original uh, theories found, founder, I would say, um, there's a four way to interpret it. He used four ways to interpret this, um, I would say, X is an element of A. And first one is definitely something you already know. X is an element of the set A. So programming language people, you write code, uh, you would probably use this way to understand it. Um, you say true is a Boolean, and so true is a Boolean type. True is an element of a Boolean type, right? And there's other way to interpret this, including things like X is a proof object for proposition A, X is a program satisfying specification A, and X is a solution satisfying problem A. And to be honest, the fourth one is my favorite one, so later I'll use the example for the fourth one to explain this. So firstly, like, uh, we, when we look at X is an element A, we need to define um, what is set A first. So um, the set A, basically, uh, we, need a, we have uh, two conditions here. The first condition is what is in this set A. And we also need to define like, uh, uh, what condition makes elements equal. So you have two elements in A, three elements in A, whatever. Uh, are they equal or are they not equal? That's the thing um, the, to define a set A you need. And here, let's use an example here. Uh, for example, let's say um, we have a problem. Uh, it's lost weight. We want lost weight. And you can definitely find a lot of solution for this problem. For example, you can think about like you can swim, you can jogging, you can eat healthier. Uh, I think three ways you can lose weight. But the thing is, like, uh, the outcome of these three ways could be different. Let's say, for example here, let's say swimming may lose you three kilogram, and jogging may lose you five kilogram, and somehow just the eat healthy also makes you uh, lose five kilogram, uh, let's say, in a certain duration. And so in this case, you may say, like, uh, okay, so uh, jogging is equivalent uh, to eat healthier, but they are different from swimming. And that's the idea of like, a, uh, first that you define this problem and you, you, you have some solutions in it. Uh, the second thing we need to answer is uh, how to tell set A equal to set B. To answer this, uh, it's pretty simple. Just you, you can find out an, uh, an element in set A and also in set B. And of course, you can find out the same equivalence uh, relation x prime, or not x prime variable, that's also in uh, uh, set A and also in set B. And you can do so for y as well. You can find another element in B and also in A, and another y prime relationship, equivalency relationship in B and A too. 
With this, you can say set A is equal to set B. Uh, this may be like, a, let's use another example here. Let's say we have another problem is improved fitness. So uh, we, we want to ask a, a thing like, is, is loss weight equivalent to improved fatness? And that, that could be, it could be, right? So if you can find two, two conditions, first is you can find two solutions to solve both problems. And you can also find an equivalent solution in, in both problems. Then you can say these two problems are equivalent. Uh, however, like in this case, it's probably difficult to, to find out the equivalent problem, but it's easy to find a counterexample here. So let's say uh, we already know like uh, jogging is same. Uh, I mean, these three things we believe we can, can improve fitness can also lose weight. But the thing is like the relationship between them will be different. So you, can, you cannot say these two problems is the same problem. That's basically the idea of like, we, 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 how we define X is an element of set A. Okay, let me drink some water. Okay, so uh, further, uh, let's look, into, uh, look further into how mathematician uh, in here, Permatin Lov, how, how Permatin Lov define a set. The answer is so-called general rules. So if you study computer science or mathematics in school, academic world, I think they will use this a lot to define all the types. Uh, for, for this particular case, um, the general rules, uh, they are basically four rules. Uh, first, this formation rule, uh, it, it's a way to define a problem. And in this case, we can say A is a set, that's a formation rule, we define, define the set. And second introduction rule is we define the elements inside the set, so the solutions for the, for the problem we defined. And third one is the most uh, tricky one, I'll say. It's like uh, you, if you pick a solution, uh, it's a premise, you pick a solution, and this solution can solve the problem. And that's the idea of the invention rule. And equality rule is similar, but slightly different is like if you pick a specific solution, then that specific solution solves the problem. Uh, let's use Boolean as an example to see how the mathematician defined Boolean type. Uh, here, here's the example here. Formation rule, of course, we can just say there's a Boolean type, we define it. And secondly is um, elements in Boolean. So Boolean is a sim what, probably one of the simplest type here. We only have true and false, that's what we know. Uh, Elimination rule is something like a, a pretty complicated. We have a premise, we have a Boolean type, and we have a condition set. So there's a selector to build a condition set. And then we can say, okay, we have a true condition set and false condition set. If we put true in it, this selector, we got a true condition set. That true condition set is part of the Boolean set. And then equality rule is the, pretty much the same, but just that like, if you put true into this selector, you, this true is in true condition set, so it's in Boolean set. So that's the idea of this uh, definition. And I'm not going to talk further like list and class and whatever complicated type you can find in a program language. Uh, basically, this is a simple idea here. Until here, like you may just ask, like, wait, wait, this is too far away from our life. Like, that's true, like the Python is a wonderful word, but math is like something like, well, we just don't want to know that far. And so uh, the idea I, I want to give you here is not, not really like a how mathematicians define all sort of things. It's basically as a master's uh, class about type theory. They will teach you how all, all sort of things, all sort of types, maybe in an examination, they, they will just check your understanding of each type and you can define the premise for the elimination rule and so on. But in here, it's just like, a, I just want to let you know is that types, all the types you use in a programming language are behind math theory. And some of you may just smartly just to say, hey, um, everything is pi object pointer in Python, right? So, so which means like we have string, we have true, we have whatever new type, they are all Python pi object pointer. So everything is just a pi object. Uh, the answer is yes, it's true. So everything is uh, pi object in Python with type information, in fact. So um, pi object's header defines a thing called ob underscore type. Uh, so for, for all the object under, under, um, under who, when you run the interpreter, they actually check objects ob underscore type to, to know what's that. And then um, it can, the interpreter can understand that and determine the operation in runtime. And there are some functions you can use, like a type instance, it's subclass, and so on. Uh, this three function defines, in, I think, just somewhere in type 
that C or some, somewhere in, 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 in the interpreter. And you can use them to check the, uh, the, the, the thing we, we just talked about, such as we say everything is object, that's true. That's the first thing. You can put everything there and uh, it's, extent, it's instance object, it will be true. And you can also check the, the class relations, that's just, uh, it's, a, it's pulling a, an object, that, that will also be true. And you can definitely just reverse it, say it's object and boolean. Uh, definitely, it's not, not the case. And that, that's the thing back to the theory we just mentioned, right? So it, it's, you cannot just reverse talk in this way. And you can also check the um, true and the false in a boolean type. Um, that will also be the case. Um, so um, in fact, there's kind of a fun fact is like there's a, definitely a PEP called uh, PEP2A5. Uh, it's very far away from today, more than 20 years ago uh, by Guido. So it, this path is definitely about just the Boolean. So um, at that time, Python doesn't have Boolean, so Guido thinks like, hey, we need to have a Boolean, otherwise people just uh, often use like a define a true variable equals to one false variable equals to zero and so on. And, and, and in their code, it's just that they do so. So this path probably by far is the, I, I don't know if there's other types uh, path, but this is one of the, the, the path is pretty interesting to know. And in this path, it basically implements the Boolean type. And if you check the, 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 the header files, you'll find out like a, this is the definition of a Boolean type. Simply speaking, uh, there's, on top of that, we define uh, Boolean is a type. And later we have a lot of building functions, constructor, destructor, and uh, some functions like you can run in C, uh, that would be faster, so they do that in C instead, you don't need to do that in Python. And the other important thing is uh, there's a base type. So in Boolean's case, uh, Boolean in Python, in fact, is integer. So that's maybe another fact that you may not know before. Just uh, if you check a six instance Boolean uh, for integer, that will be true. Yeah. Okay. Um, now we finish the Python. Um, I will say basic type. Um, we need to talk a bit further because um, the thing the the the, the in the real world, uh, Python world today, uh, when we talk about type, we actually talk about another thing called annotation. So annotation is based on a thing called gradual typing. Um, gradual typing here, um, simply just uh, um, before gradual typing, um, py Python code is just like a, the top side, so it's untyped. And after gradual typing, you can partially type your code, you can fully type your code. Uh, the thing is you got annotation here. That's exactly, uh, the idea of the type of Python here, we mean. Um, I don't think this talk is for people who want to know why we need gradual typing, why we want to write a notation for Python. Uh, that's not, not, definitely not something I want to focus today. But uh, still, I mean, I just use one slide here to explain that. Uh, we need gradual typing, that's because if you look at this code in, in the top side, uh, there's no notation, which means you can put anything there, and some some of the input if you put, you may surprise, you may get some surprise outcomes, such as string multiply um, integer or, or list multiply integer. Got some surprising outcome. That definitely is likely not something you expect to calculate the area of the rectangle. All right. So gradual typing theory is another type theory, and it's a pay-as-you-go type system. And probably the theory here is a type maybe partially known and unknown at compiled time. And the reference here, the first paper is by uh, Jeremy Thick uh, in 2006. Uh, this is a paper uh, probably took the, the fundamental idea of the gradual typing. And later, uh, Jeremy Thick writes uh, another book uh, in Python. Actually, the, the, the example called is in Python, what is gradual typing? And in the same year, uh, I mean, we have the PEP4A3, that is the theory of PEP4A4 you may heard of about type hints. And one thing I didn't focus on in the, when I introduced uh, type theory is type system. So gradual type theory and type theory, they are both certain kind of type system. That's the thing, and so we should introduce uh, what is type system here now. All right, so type system, um, I mean, when we talk about system, a uh, system design, usually it's just like some input we got into a system and then we generate some output, that's the idea. So type system is exactly like that, it's a system. It's a system to check the type consistency. So the input will be 
a lot of element in sets. So let's get X element in A set, Y element in B set, and so on. And this type system there will basically just check, hey, is X element in A set, is Y element in B set? If everything is yes, then we just, we are good, right? So each element is in the right set. But if there's anything wrong, then this system will just report to, to you that so there's something wrong, this, this element is not in that set. And Python type consistency check before um, PEP 4A3, that's exactly just like this. Uh, when you run the CPython interpreter, it does do the, the kind of type consistency check that you may not know, because usually when you run the interpreter, you only care about outcome, or you, your program can run or cannot run. Um, but in fact, it's under the hood, there is a check about like, uh, is this element in a certain set? And that's the idea. And after PEP 7.4a3, uh, uh, we have the additional thing called type checker, and uh, the input can now be partially typed and fully typed. Now. And again, CPython interpreter is still a type, type system. It can still check the types. And we have type checker additionally also can do the same thing, but uh, it's in static time. So the difference is CPython uh, execute your code, and uh, type checker doesn't. Type checker just uh, scan your code, doesn't really run it. For example, if, if your program transfer mo your money to another, from one bank to another bank, you probably don't want to run your code uh, if, if you just want to check the, the type consistency. So type checker serves, serves that purpose, and it only produces a type error or not for you. So, uh, I mean, here, here I just want to ask you, like, uh, okay, so do you think these two things are type consistent. If you think so, please raise your hand. All right, I see some, some hands here. The gradual type theory here, uh, first, the rule number one is uh, all program parameters are default to any type. So this any type is consistency, consistent to all the types. And in this case, because uh, before, we don't assign A to any, we don't annotate any types for A variable. It will be annotated as any type. And then, um, in this case, um, the, the, we check any type and integer type is consistent or not. And yes, they are consistent because by, by, by the rule, uh, any, type, any type is uh, consistent, is type consistent to other, any other types. Um, so in this case, we can say A and B is type consistent. And second question again, uh, do you think these two functions are type consistent? Raise your hand, please. Okay, again, rule number one here is if you don't assign anything to, to, to the variable, uh, in this case, the function, the argument will be assigned to the any type, and the return type will also be assigned to any type. And by the rule, we will compare two functions, they are type consistent or not. We basically check the arguments and return value type is consistent. And any type is consistent to uh, any type. So integer type is consistent. And here, we'll say they, these two functions are type consistent. And third question, um, we have this A, we don't assign any annotation equals to one, and B, we say is integer. And what it, what it will be the C type? Do you think the C type will be an integer? Uh, you can raise your hand here. This is, this is actually a tricky one. Right, I don't see any hands here. That's actually pretty good, I will say. Um, so uh, in gradual typing theory, if you don't assign a type, A will be assigned to any type. And then if you add any type to integer type, it will be any type. But in fact, uh, in the real world, Python type checkers, it doesn't work in this way. You will find that A will be inferred as an integer type, and then C will also be integer type. Um, so gradient number theory has another two rules. I'll just quickly uh, go through that. First thing is pretty simple. Just uh, uh, if you have a call like this, um, it's not type annotated. So we, we consider uh, it's type annotated, and, and the, it, the uh, it, you, you, you don't really assign the uh, function's type, so uh, it doesn't care because it's any type, and so we consider it's okay. And the other one is if you try to assign some type and you put some inconsistent variable to it, you got some uh, argument type error. So basically, the, the, the idea is this system should reject program have, uh, program has any uh, inconsistency in the known part of types uh, at static time. And at runtime, 
uh, if there's any any unknown types in runtime, like uh, your your another, your type system, your, your program can still catch that in runtime. It's just like static time you cannot catch that, but in runtime you can catch that. And here's one example that in, in my Python reference, um, this specific case, if you put a, a string in, into this uh, function, the string is got split to list of string, and the list of string plus a string will raise the type error in Python. And some type checkers, uh, particularly in my Py. Uh, has no issue, detects no issue for this case. So uh, we have a check away so far. Um, I think, uh, let, me, let me check how long we spent. We spent 25 minutes of our type theory so far. So we know like Python type system are based on type theory and Gorilla typing theory is some, some, something that not really, um, it ha has a solid mathematic uh, theory behind. Then uh, we, we should talk about another thing is type checkers now. Uh, Here's a collab. Um, you can also check this later. I mean, this, this collab basically is pretty simple just to try to let you be able to easily to compare the type checkers. Um, remember the, in the PAP 7 to 9, uh, the second part, we say these PAP are endorsed by, was endorsed by all major type checkers. So including PyType, PyWrites, and uh, MyPy and Pyre. So they mentioned these four type checkers, so let's just check them then. So let's compare them uh, quickly. Uh, firstly, MyPy is definitely something you may know. It's a kind of OG. Uh, it's developed on, on the Dropbox initially. I think Grido was hired at that time. And then now it's under C Pythons. Uh, the time they started this development is 2012 December. That's actually earlier than the PEP 4A3 is there. And uh, the advantage to use my Pi will say, if you ask me why do you need to use my Pi, I will say because it adopts a feature fast. Fa uh, I will say if you want to use some new, newest type features, then my Pi should su usually support that uh, in a fast pace. And there's PyType uh, by Google from 2015, and Pyre by Meta 2017, and PyWrite by Microsoft in 2019. That's four major type checkers they mentioned. And basically when we say uh, other type checkers, we only care about why not use MyPy. Just there's MyPy, why do you develop another, another type checker? What, what's the point? And for Google's case, they, they, they want the, the MyPy, they have a talk about this uh, by the, I think I would say, original developer, Rebecca Lear. Um, it's, it highlights the uh, capability of MyPy to do the type inference. So the coverage of the uh, Py type will be higher than MyPy because it can detect the, it can auto annotate certain type by using type inference. And um, Pyre, the reason why Meta do it is because they, they consider they, there's large scale called Instagram backend, and uh, they want to adapt the graduate typing at that time, and they want a fat, fast, fattest solution for that, and my pipe may not be a, a good solution for them. Um, the other reason is also because they have some existing solution for hack, that's a PHP Meta, so they just want to build, build up a new, new new solution for it. And Microsoft just one, I would say, uh, the reason is probably some developer here, I believe, um, just this IDE integration. So uh, we know like uh, Microsoft is good at those IDE stuff. And they have a language protocol. So what it does is like they need an efficient way to when you change one line of code and you don't need to rerun the entire uh, static analysis on your entire code. It can just uh, change uh, to detect what's wrong in the certain code line lines change. And that's the reason that they call it a daily or just the intent type evaluator. And also what's to mention is that this Pyra is the probably the only uh, type checker not written in Python. So um, we talk about many type checkers here. What do we want to know is like, uh, uh, how do Python type system slow types? We have type checker S. We have many type checkers here. There's a function called reveal type, a third type uh, in type system, and it supports, um, basically before Python 3.1, uh, only the, only the uh, type checker supports it, so you need to write the code like this. But after that, you can write the code just uh, directly. And this function does just uh, check the uh, types for different type systems. And there's a paper, um, Python three types in the wild, uh, published probably around 2020, yeah, and by RPI and IBN. This, this paper compares the uh, MyPy and the PyType. Uh, it's 
for, for me, it's not important, today it's not important to talk about the detail of this paper. Instead, uh, there's an assignment mentioned in the paper that's worth to look into. Because this few assignment in the type theory presents a uh, different way, uh, can represent how the uh, type checker resolve type differently. So um, the example here, actually there's a GitHub issue I, I cut uh, to just figure out this, and it's kind of resolved uh, by improving the document, take document for the, the, the function, review type function. Um, the variable assignment will be like this. We have A assigned to one, and later we change A, uh, assign, uh, assign the string to A. And the second case is the list of integer we assign to A, and then we append some uh, string to A, so that, that will change the, the type definition. And the other class variable is sim similar to variable assignment. It's just the, the, class, the variable under the class they assign it. And let's see like, uh, the type checker's result. And we'll find out like here, um, if you use MyPy, uh, sorry, let's, let's look at like CPython first. The CPython will interpret this clearly, as you expect it, except you don't know the, uh, uh, the, the type under the list. That's the, the, they call it like intentionally erase the type to make the Python more efficient in runtime. And in MyPy case, you'll find out like you cannot do so. MyPy will report all the errors here. You cannot change the type in, the, in, in, in that time. That's, that's because uh, the first, uh, when you assign integer to, to a variable, it's already inferred this A variable as an integer type. And then when you assign a string, it will just uh, tell you like you cannot do so. And PyType in this case is relatively smart here. It just uh, do, do the, the, the kind of type uh, inference for you and it does everything correctly. And then how about like, let's just say like we, 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 we do it uh, with type of notation here. We tell those type checkers we, 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 we know the type is like this. And then now we know like A could be integer or string, and A could be a list of integer of string. And then you'll see the result will be like this. Again, the C Python just tell you everything as expected. And my Python case, uh, it, it does some type of inference. You find out in the beginning it, it could be integer and string, and later it's inferred as a string. And in different cases, you'll find out actually even if we type annotate our code, the my Py and Py, Py type, the behavior is still different. In, in the third case, it, you got a different result here. So I'm not going to explain like why you got different result. Instead, I just want to give you a takeaway here is in, this, in that paper, it mentions one thing. Arguably have two fundamentally different type system violates the Zen of Python, which famous states that uh, there should be only one and preferably only one obvious way to do a thing. And so definitely, uh, can we rule a way to develop Python uh, type checkers? So make all the type check checker resolve the type equivalently. That's the uh, least takeaway here. And move on, uh, new specification in type systems, that's another thing I want to talk about. Uh, by the way, like, uh, by saying new specification today, again, uh, it's not about the first type theories, pep 2 a file, that Boolean type we mentioned earlier. Instead, is the specification about something that is option, usually optional hints, and um, basically not always checked at the runtime. And for those are examples, uh, pep, and I'll use the third one, the self type list one, to give you a, a go through it. Uh, still, like a pep, pep six, now, uh, seven and three is self-type. So, again, no, not, not talking about detail here, just uh, the motivation of this pep is before you have this pep, when you, when you try to, to have an inherent relationship of, uh, of different classes, you'll find out there's a problem uh, without self-type. They need to use the uh, type var to define, the, the, to bound it, so, so to make it correctly. Uh, I would say to make it uh, uh, expectedly. And uh, with the self-type, uh, they expect you write code in this way, very clean, probably don't need to explain this further. That's the motivation for this PEP. And in fact, is this implementation in CPython is super, super simple. Uh, you can see just one PR. And that, that PR uh, is probably about 100 lines of code, and most of the lines of code are just the comments. Uh, firstly, you can, the, fir the first one is just that you, you, can, you can import this self-type in your code now. And the second thing is like you can return this self-type in your code as well. Uh, so the third thing is that there's a kind of place to, to describe like how you should use this uh, self. But that's it, right? Because CPython does nothing on these optional hints. So you just need to support this uh, thing. Okay, well you can now write self. 
Um, but a type checker is not a story. In, in my Python, let's take a look at my Python implementation. You'll find out like a, it's kind of like a, about, like almost eight times more effort than C Python to support this. It needs to support the thing in, in their semantic analyzer to support self type. It also needs to support in their type checker. And further, like because the, we, when we are pass the code, we usually pass the code into a tree with many nodes. So you need to support the node as a self type. And that's pretty much the, the, the PR. You can look into this, this PR later if you are interested in. And then how about, how about another type checker? Let's just, just check one more type checker. Uh, in this case, let's check PyType. So PyType, I'm not going to talk about detail of how those PRs are doing. Uh, in fact, I also don't really check all the details there. You need to understand how to implement uh, py, py, uh, type checkers. Otherwise, like, that could be too complicated about that. The thing, what I want to say is, the timeline to support a new specification you see here, uh, you'll find out like a C Python text uh, from the path to implementation takes only three months. And my Py takes 10 months to implement it. And Py type takes 21 months to implement it. That's a really fun fact that like, uh, once, okay, people are really happy, we finally has, we'll have self type in Python, let's make our code really beautiful. But they find out the type checker actually takes Long, long, way longer time than they thought to support that new, new annotation. That's exactly another jack way. Can we shorten this noticeable time gap to support new types, new specification to different type checkers? PEP729 could be a solution. Uh, we don't know yet, it's an ongoing thing, but we we'll say these two tech away here, right? Can we rule the way to develop type checkers? and can we shorten this noticeable time gap to the level yield? Let me see. Okay, I still have time, so I'm going to just talk a bit further. Uh, in fact, when you see this photo, you see another onion on, on top, so that's your turn to do it. So a bonus here is like uh, you can try to implement your own mini type checker to under, understand type checker better, like me. Um, here is my implementation. It's not necessary you check my implementation, but just to let you know like how to implement the type checker. Uh, again, the implementation for this system is simple because you plan to implement a system to check the type. And so your input is supposed to be untyped code, partially typed code, and fully typed code, and your output just to be type error. And here will be some example you can try. Basically, they are all very basic. The argument type arrow, you can see you can compare the OK's output and NG output, and assignment uh, type arrow and the return value type arrow. They are all very iconic uh, one. Just you see like you intentionally just uh, input something invalid, then your, your system should just report some issue. And then you got your mini type checker to do it for you. Um, mini type checkers implementation, I will say, uh, if you don't know how to implement it, I recommend a library called libcst. Uh, it's actually used by PyType Empire as well. So, and and uh, this libcst does the thing, it just parse your, helps to pass your code into a tree. And then you can use this tree as a thing to traverse it twice. Firstly, to semantic, semantic analysis it, and then type check it. Uh, that's exactly what my Py support self type, you may notice that. And if you feel very boring, then further you can just try more inputs. Uh, of course, you come up, come up with some uh, currently supported new uh, subspecifications of Python types. Or I recommend you try generics, because generics, generics is often tricky, like you need to parse the code twice. First time, you need to collect the type information. Second time, you need to use the information to check the type. And right, that's it. So thank you, and yeah. Thank you very much, Kier, for that informative talk. We have five minutes for Q&A. We have two microphones. If somebody has a question, can step up uh, to the microphone and ask the question. Let's see if we have people who actually want one. And there we go. Please ask your question. So you look like a person who knows a lot about uh, type checkers. And what type checker do you use then? Uh, in my case, because I work for some famous big company, so we, we use, we, I, I'm, I'm used that uh, comparison, I work for one of a company of them, so we use that. Uh, it, your question probably is more about like a, what type checker I recommend you to use, maybe. Exactly. I will say 
if you don't know what to use, then likely you just need to use MyPy. And if you really want to seek for some specific purpose thing, such as you have large scale code, you may look into the, the Pyre. And if you use IDE, maybe Microsoft, they just recommend use their, their type checker. And if your system is like a, not, not really type annotated, you can consider the PyType, they, they have a higher coverage. But PyType has a limitation, it's like their, their support is often slower than the Python version. Like right now, they support up to Python 3.11 only, so that's some, something you need to put into your consideration, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the question. And it looks like our audience is getting hungry, so we, I don't see any other question. Are you going to ask a question? Yes, please come to the microphone. <laughs> Oh. Hello, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you think that at some point in time, or if you have any information that is a bit hidden, that um, at runtime, if we pass the wrong type to a function that was annotated with a different type, we might get an early run um, type error instead of just the function proceeding. Sorry, I don't really get what, what's your, your question. So if you think that uh, maybe at some point in Python, they will have uh, checks a bit earlier. For instance, at the time that we make the function call. You mean interpreter itself? Yeah. I, I, I think uh, probably no, because when I propose some kind of, I remember there's another issue I, I cut to, to, to the C Python, and they say like uh, usually they focus on the performance first. And that kind of additional check could co to have uh, the efficiency cost. And that's not something they will try. Uh, I think that, that one example I can share with you later is about some type thing in data class. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. We have a question at the other microphone, please. Yes, so two questions. So the first one, is there any effort to standardize the error messages between type checkers? So they're like, kind of like throw the same error message. Uh, rather than depending on what they're, how they're working, they might draw different. And the second one, is there any thought put into how new type checkers can join the club proposed by PEP 729? These are very, those are very good questions. Uh, I would say the answer is, that's the reason we need the PEP 729, and because you have a, a certain council you can uh, look into and uh, you, you can consult with. And if you want to join the club, you are a new type checker developer, want to write, such as a, a fat, fat is the type checker in Rust, maybe, then that could be the thing that like, uh, people can join together to discuss about that. And about the error message, I will say the same. Just uh, it, I, I'm, I'm sure like uh, this console was there after a lot of type checker was there, were there. So to, I will say to unify the error message, that could be the thing uh, in, in the wrong run in the future likely can happen. Uh, if, Again, the, the way type checkers resolve types are different. So that's probably the biggest challenge they need to figure it out. And that's my tech of that. But again, PEP729 could be a solution, we don't know, but that's the reason why we form this process, yeah, I believe. Thank you once very much for the questions and answers. This is, alas, all we have time for now. Uh, so let's have another big applause for Kirschau. Thank you. Thank you very much.